Hello friends, welcome to the Church of the Apostles. Thank you for joining us today, wherever you are around the world. We pray that God will use this time to bless you and that the Holy Spirit will speak to you in a personal way today. Back in the 80s when we used to read newspapers, But I used to read the comic strips. My favorite were the comic strips of the uh, Peanuts cartoons. And if, because some of them really have some great wisdom, and if I liked something, I would cut it and file it away. One of those that I filed away way back then, the younger generation probably don't know what I'm talking about, just humor me. Um, one of those cartoon strips where Lucy says to Schroeder, guess what? If you don't tell me you love me, I'm going to hold my breath until I pass out. <laughs> Looking from his piano, Schroeder says, uh, breath holding in children is an increasing phenomenon. It could indicate a metabolic disorder. <laughs> 40 grams of vitamin B6 might help. I think probably it. That's it. You need vitamin B6. You might also consider eating more bananas, avocados, and chopped liver. Then he goes back to his piano. At that point, Lucy sighs and says, I asked for love, but I got chopped liver. <laughs> I don't need to tell you that our generation has confused love with chopped liver. Today's world, a whole lot of people are confusing love. Today's of Love means a lot of things, including immorality and immoral activities and even abomination. Today, people are totally confusing love with lust. Today, in the West, particularly in the West, love is being defined and, in some incidents, redefined by those who have experienced very little of it. In terms of familiarity, 1 Corinthians 13 probably is the best known and the least practiced chapter in the Bible. I think most of you agree it is often quoted but seldom comprehended. It is often used but seldom practiced. It is often read at weddings but soon forgotten. Today I want to do what I always do, and that is put 1 Corinthians 13 in its context. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a breath of fresh air in the midst of this dizzying set of problems in the church of Corinth. It, it, it's an oasis in a desert of rebuke. It is a positive note in the midst of a continuing reproof and continuing correction on the part of the great apostle. In fact, it's a gem, it's a, it's, a, it's a rough, a diamond in the rough. In spite of that, it is a huge mistake to take 1 Corinthians 13 and separate it from 12 and 14. Huge mistake. It's a colossal error that some people make if they ignore what came before it and what came after it. I am absolutely convinced that you cannot comprehend 1 Corinthians 13 in isolation. Because in chapter 12, we saw in the last message the importance of our gifts and the importance of discovering these gifts and an absolute necessity for a healthy lifestyle, Christian spiritual lifestyle, not only to discover your gifts, but to practice those gifts, to use these gifts. 
And then in chapter 14, in the next message, we're going to see how it is filled with warnings, a warning against those who want to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit for selfish purposes. And that is why chapter 13, smack in the middle between 12 and 14. Don't miss that. Why am I saying this? Because chapter 13 gives us the right attitude toward these gifts, the right attitude toward the use of these gifts. Chapter 13 shows us the proper motive that we are supposed to have toward the gifts of the Holy Spirit that every believer has. Chapter 13 reveals to us God's plan for His gifts that He has given to us. In the last message again from chapter 12, we saw in the Corinthians church there were two major errors about the gifts, about the discovering and the use of it. Two major errors that Paul was dealing with. Um, what are they? Let me just recite them for you. Error number one, with those who are feeling resentment because their gifts of the Holy Spirit were not the showy gifts, not the visible gift, not the spectacular ones. On the other hand, error number two, those who had the showy gifts, the spectacular gifts, they were looking down their noses upon those who did not have them. In chapter 13, Paul tells us that love is far from being this gooey, mushy, fuzzy feeling that we talk about. It is actually, listen to me carefully, 1 Corinthians 13 is actually a two-by-four. You heard me right. It's a two-by-four. Then he's hitting the church with that two-by-four, chapter 13. You never thought about it this way. Now you do. Because having a spiritual gift does not make you spiritual. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Having spiritual does not make you, gift, make you spiritual. Listen to me. I have known great, famous preachers who are carnal, and so do you. Only walking in the Spirit makes you spiritual. I want you to hear me right because this is very important, because the believers in the Corinthian church, they were very similar to the believers in the Ephesians church as we see them not in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, but in the book of Revelation chapter 2. I say, what is that similarity? Well, they have lost their first love for Christ. <laughs> they were running on empty. They've lost their first love for Christ, but they were maintaining the program. They lost their first love for Christ, but they were riving the engine of the church. They lost their first love, but they kept the machine running. They lost their first love, but they maintained the outward facade of activities. God forbid that this ever happened in this church. And the reason they lost their first love is because they moved from the source of love. They got so bogged down in their self-interest, they got so bogged down that they've forgotten whose church it is. Beloved, not a single time that I come down the street and turn to this church building without reminding myself, this is the church of Jesus Christ. A major part of the problem in the Corinthian church, as it is the problem in so many churches today, is that they think Love is just a nice feeling. Love is just warm affection. That love is just a romantic desires. Now, don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with these things. They may be a manifestation of the true love. They may be an expression of the true love, but they're not really the true love. These are not the true love that the Bible tells us about here. The agape, or agape, as some pronounce it, <laughs> is not that self-seeking love. Agape demands something of us to give for of us. We often say, oh, I'll die for you. How is that? Talk is cheap. Show me how you die. <laughs> Talk is cheap. Let me see if you can die to your opinion. 
Let me see if you can die to your ideas. Let me see if you can die to your possessions. Let me see if you can die to your feelings. Again, in a man in a movie says to a woman, baby, you're beautiful and I love you. <laughs> they always going to say, I love you. <laughs> oh, but would you still love me if I cease to be beautiful? I want to ask that question, would you still love me? Or if the woman says to the man, you're strong and you're dependable and I love you, but would you still love me? When I have no job, I have no money, and now my body is raked with pain in the bed, will you still love me? Sometimes it's really easier to die for someone than to live for someone. It is easier to die for Christ than to live for Christ because living for Christ means you're daily dying. That's what it means. I ask myself the question often, often, often I ask myself, that question. Do I love that person enough that when I see that person in sin or sinning in, or a sin in their life, can I come alongside of them and lovingly help them to repent and turn to the Lord? That is true love. Hear me right. Agape has no room for pride, arrogance, or self-promotion. In John chapter 13, the Bible said when Jesus loved his disciples, he, disciple, he loved them to the end. Or another translation, he loved them to perfection. He loved them to completeness. Here's what I have learned through the years from many painful experiences. I won't bore you with them. I have discovered that lovelessness Lovelessness is the root of disobedience to God. Seldom do you read in the Gospels about Jesus saying to the disciples, I love you guys, I love you guys, I love you guys, which we do, and that's fine, but you know, but, but you know what? They knew, they felt it, they've experienced it. He didn't have to keep repeating it to them. Okay, now... After this short introduction, I get to the text. But I want you to fasten your seat belt because I'm going to move fast. You ready? Amen. All right. Verse 1. If I am the most eloquent speaker in the world, but incapable of loving, I am making a whole bunch of noises. That's really what rough translation. In fact, I'm going to give you a lot of rough translations, but you'll get the meaning. <laughs> you might be a person with silver tongue who sway millions of people, but without true biblical love, <laughs> it's a bunch of noise. The Corinthians were clamoring for the gift of tongues. They all want to speak in tongues. They want to speak in tongues. Of all the gifts of the Spirit we'll see in the next message, they want that one. Why? Paul said, <laughs> I speak even more than all of you, but even if I speak all of the languages that is known to the world. And I don't have love. I'm a windbag. Verse 2, to proclaim the Word of God without love will have no lasting or eternal impact. Oh, people might say, oh, look at him. Isn't he awesome? Only God is awesome. Oh, look at her. Isn't she wonderful? No. God says, that's a bunch of hot air. <laughs> Not only that, but if I comprehend all the secrets of the universe, if, you, uh, if, if I'm able to know beyond the physical realm, if I'm able to see beyond the physical realm, if I'm able to perform supernatural acts, all of that, is nothing without the fruit of love. Beloved, you know and I know that knowledge without agape produces spiritual snobbery, cockiness. And I pray to God you don't misunderstand me. Spiritual knowledge 
is wonderful. It really is. It is absolutely beyond description. Spiritual knowledge is a beautiful gift, and I thank God for it. Spiritual knowledge can be a blessing and and fruit-filled in the work of God, but only if it is ministered in love. Even if I'm a great man of faith, which I'm not, who I can trust God for supernatural miracles, supernatural intervention, which I believe He has given me that to do on behalf of others, never on behalf of myself. This means nothing if it is not exercised in love. Jonah was a great prophet. Oh, he was a great prophet in the Old Testament. He experienced some of the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, revival known to man. It is absolutely amazing that he had total faith, complete faith, that if the Word of God is preached to the pagan Ninevites, they will repent and they will believe. He knew that. that he, he believed that by faith. Oh, but Jonah did not have love for the Ninevites. Remember what I said earlier. Lovelessness leads to disobedience. And you read at the end of Jonah's life, sat under a tree, feeling sorry for himself, for his success in the work of God. Lovelessness is the source of disobedience. Verse 3, eloquence, tongues, prophecy, spiritual knowledge, and even faith. None of these, or all of these combined without love, amount to anything. But there's more. Add to this list benevolence. That is giving of everything, giving your entire net worth away. And then you have to take a vow of poverty. If it is not done in genuine love, it means nothing to God. It is not only giving away of your possessions, all of them, all of them. Even if you give your body and be martyred, and we're seeing more martyrs for Christ today than any other time in 2,000 years of Christian history, but even if I give my body to be martyred for Christ, if it is not done out of love and for love, it means nothing. The loveless person produces nothing, is nothing, and gains nothing. Look at verses 4 and 5. Here is the most comprehensive biblical description of the fullness of love. The list here tells us what love is and what love is not. I know we all tend to measure ourselves with others. I I know that. It's a trap that I got caught into earlier in my ministry, and so I know what I'm talking about. The only measuring stick is Jesus. You say, Michael, that's impossible. Jesus was the perfect Son of God. He was the divine Son of God. Yes, overnight it is impossible. And that is why it takes a lifetime of constant measuring and failing sometimes and succeeding other times and constantly measuring and measuring and measuring yourself with Christ. Love is patient. Listen, any serious-minded believer should be able to say, I am more Christ-like this year than I was last year. Those of us oldies, any serious-minded believer should be able to say that my Christ-likeness this decade is greater than it was last decade. This is not pride. This is just reality. It's an important reality. And that is what patience means here. Someone who wronged you, listen carefully, someone who wronged you and wounded you deeply, and it is within your power to retaliate, but you don't. Now, I can testify on the subject of patience. I've written it in my books. Patient here means never, never to retaliate when a 
person wrongs you personally. Listen, then we're going to make the distinction here. It's very important. See, in the Greek world to which Paul is writing, this is crazy talk. It is absolute crazy to say you don't retaliate. What do you mean? Because revenge in the Greek culture was a virtue. Oh, but Christ-likeness says, let God do it. He does a far better job than you can ever do or hope to do. Love is kind. You know, beloved, let me tell you, kindness has a laboratory, and the greatest laboratory for kindness is in the home. If it fails in the home, it's not going to succeed anywhere else. Love is not jealous. Uh, Shakespeare called jealousy the green sickness, the sorrows of fools. <laughs> and here's something I believe that can help us along the way. I often remind myself, oh, if somebody's better than me. There's always a better preacher. There's always a better doctor. There's always a better lawyer. There's always a better salesman. There's always somebody better than you. And when love sees someone more popular, successful, beautiful, talented, love says, more power to them. More power to them. Let me tell you something else that is so devastating about jealousy really more accurate the word envy, but it is not only want what somebody else has, but often this disease wants the other person to suffer ill. You know what I'm talking about? Hear me out, please. Jealousy is not a harmless, moderate sin. It is not and I've seen it in churches. I've seen it among pastors. Jealousy is devastating. It was jealousy on the part of Eve, jealousy of God that made Satan successful in tempting her. It was Cain's jealousy uh, of Abel that got him to kill him. It was jealousy of Joseph's brother of Joseph that caused them to sell him into slavery. It was jealousy of Aaron and his sister Miriam of their brother Moses that struck them with leprosy. It was Korah and company's jealousy of Moses that caused the earth to open and they're swallowed up. It was the official, uh, official's jealousy of Daniel that got him thrown into the den of lion. It was jealousy toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that got them thrown into the fiery furnace. It was jealousy of the Pharisees that hung Jesus on the cross. Proverbs 27, 4 says, Wrath is fierce. Anger is a flood. But who can stand before jealousy? Jealousy drives people to do some horrible and terrible things to each other. Love does not brag. What is bragging? It's trying to make other people jealous. That's why they come right next to each other. <laughs> bragging is making other people jealous of you. Love does not parade accomplishments. Jealousy is wanting what somebody else has, and bragging is parading what you have and make other people jealous of you. Jealousy puts others down in order that we may lift ourselves up. Push them down so we can brag about how great we are. <laughs> C.S. Lewis said, bragging is the uttermost evil. It is the epitome of pride. Love is not arrogant. Now, the Corinthians had no reason to be arrogant. The person is arrogant would think that everything he has, self-made, it's him, her, question. What is the cure for that? Remembering that everything, and I'm talking about everything that you have, is given to you. Everything you have is given to you. That will cure it. This fact alone would drive us to our knees instead of make us standing on tippy-toe saying, hey, look at me. 
Love does not act unbecomingly. Better translation, love does not act gracelessly, gracelessly. Love always being gracious, even to people who are rude. Did you get that? These people will cut you off on the road and uh, once you're driving. It is gracious even to people who put us down in order to raise themselves up. God bless them. Even people who are ungrateful for sacrifices that we made on their behalf. Love does not seek its own. What does that mean? It means the opposite of what we see all around us today, from self-fulfillment to self-actualization to self-serving to self-this and self-that and self-other thing. <laughs> the Corinthians would not even share their food at the love fest, communion. We saw that in chapter 11. They wouldn't share the food. Their attitude was, what mine is mine and what's yours is mine too. <laughs> Love is not easily provoked, not easily aroused to anger. Now, I've got to stop here and tell you something important. He is not talking about righteous anger. The righteous anger that flares when we see sin and the devastation of sin and the merchants of sin the righteous anger flares when we see false teachers and false pre preachers misleading thousands of people. That's righteous anger. He's not talking about this. He's talking about anger that results from our pride being injured. Love does not keep records of wrong. The Greek word logosomai from which we get the word logging. Not logging of the trees, but logging when you log down and keep records, particularly in, in accounting and financing. The purpose for entering things in, on the ledger to record it or log it in is, is important. You have a permanent record of it, so you can go back to it. Listen carefully, please. In finances and in business, this is absolutely important. It is a must. But in a relationship between a husband and wife, in a relationship between believers, that is not the case. Burn them every day. <laughs> keeping records, keeping ledgers against each other can be a source of misery for those who are keeping the books. <laughs> Love should erase the records and do it immediately. Don't wait a month or two or a year or two. It will get bigger. So get rid of it right away. Bring it to the foot of the cross. Present it under the blood of Jesus Christ. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Now, beloved, it's not an accident that the next description of love is that it rejoices in the truth. See, the Holy Spirit was not just throwing some words out there. No, no, no. These are logically organized words by the Creator of the world, the Spirit of God. Because false teachers and preachers can say, well, don't keep record of wrong. Yeah, forgive. Ah, oh, the other side of it is rejoicing in the truth. Because without rejoicing in the truth, you will not have power inside of you to be able to forgive and let go of the ledgers. <laughs> Because love does not accommodate to falsehood. No, 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 no. Love does not wink at sin. Does, love does not tolerate unrighteousness. Love cannot tolerate false doctrine. Love does not, cannot tolerate false teaching. Love cannot tolerate compromise. Love bears all things. What does that mean? You don't broadcast the failures of others before you go and talk to them. You need to talk to the person directly. You don't go out and spread rumors and false in your windows. Deal with them one-on-one. -on -one. Love believes all things. It's not suspicious or cynical. 
Love hopes all things. Even when faith is weak, love holds on to hope. Love doesn't see a person's failure to be a final or permanent. Always hopes that God is going to do His work in him or in her. Always hope. That's why believing members of this church who have ever talked to me, they will tell you this. I have said to many people on one-on-one individually, and you've heard me from this pulpit, when you have an unbelieving member of your family, don't ever, 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 ever give up praying for them. Love endures all things. This actually is a military term. And it comes from the fact that if during war, when a, an army comes and found a strategic position like a hill or a mountain, you hold on to it and you fight and you stand your ground and you never give up. It's very important. Hold on to it. Love stands against overwhelming opposition. <laughs> Love refuses to stop being, believing, and hoping, and enduring. Love never stopped loving. Why? Verses 8 to 13 tells you why. Because in heaven there will be no need for faith or hope. Why do we need faith in heaven? We have faith now because we can't see God. But in heaven we'll be seeing Jesus face to face. We will see Him on the throne being glorified and praised and adored and worshipped. There is no need for faith or hope because we hope for in Christ because we can't see Him. But there will be need, no need for spiritual gifts because we will have the fullness of the Spirit. And yet love is forever the very air that we're going to breathe in heaven. Amen. Give God glory. Why? Because God is love. I want to tell you two concluding stories. The first story took place in the days when Oliver Cromwell was, the, was reigning as the Lord Protector of England. A young soldier was sentenced to death. His beloved fiancé appealed to Cromwell, please commute his death sentence. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. It was decided that the young man will be executed when the curfew bell sounded. And when the sexton, that's the caretaker in the the English language, in the English churches, call him sexton. And the sexton came to ring the bell. He held onto that rope. Eh! The bell wouldn't ring. Try it again. Eh! The bell wouldn't ring. This never happened before. This is a huge bell, the big clapper. But it wouldn't ring. And finally, they went up on the belfry. And they found that the beloved fiancé of this young soldier wrapped her body around the clapper, around the clapper. So every time they pulled the rope, the bell wouldn't ring. Every time they pulled the rope, the bell wouldn't ring. Her body was smashed, bruised, but she would not let go of that clapper. When they brought her down to Cromwell, and he saw the bruise and the bleeding on this woman's body, he commuted her beloved sentence. Now, what loyalty? What commitment, what love, and what a contrast with the following story. A great theologian, pastor, preacher, hymn writer by the name of George Matheson. He began to notice his eyesight is 
somewhat fuzzy, so he decided to go to the doctor to check his eyesight. And the doctor said, George, I have bad news for you. You're going to lose your eyesight. He was absolutely torn on the inside, not for his sake, but of his fiancée, whom he loved so dearly. He loved her genuinely with every genuine love. He, 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 he couldn't even see life without her. So he picked up some courage, and he went over to her house, and he announced the news to his fiancée. And as soon as she heard that he's going to be blind, she took the ring of her hand and she gave it to him. She said, sorry, George, I can't marry you. For the next several months, George Matheson was in deep, deep emotional pain. And then the Holy Spirit, as he does for all of us, began to shift his sight from his situation, from his circumstances, to the loving Savior. And he began to think of the love of Christ. And then he sat down and pinned the words to this amazing hymn that we're going to be singing right now. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. This is talking about the unconditional love of Jesus for you and you and you and you and you. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depth its flow may richer and fuller be. Let me ask you this. Has your love been met with rejection? Has your love been met with betrayal? Has your love been met with indifference? Has your love been met with anger? Has your love been met with hatred? Has your love been met by selfishness and jealousy and resentment? Don't stop loving, for love endures forever. Say it with me, for love Thank you for being part of our worship today. We would love to hear from you. Please contact us and tell us about what God is doing in your life. If you are in the Atlanta area, we hope that you can visit us in person. I'd love to shake your hands. May God bless you today and throughout the week.